Well, shall we start off? Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Can you uh, see uh, that? So the presentation is uh, about logging. Uh, as Lauren teased a few minutes ago, um, we're going to break this into two um, sessions. The first session is more about how and why you keep um, your log. And the second session is going to be more focused on once you have a log, how can you verify the contacts that you've made and use that for awards or whatever uh, interests you. So um, we're going to try and cover a lot of material tonight. So uh, keep in mind, these slides will all be available on uh, the website. Uh, so you don't need to take detailed notes. You can just go there and see them. So um, let's see. It's not changing. Let's see. All right, there we go. Um, so these are the people that are going to be participating tonight. Uh, so like I said, it's a two-part presentation. The first one is how do you maintain a log? What do you log? Why do you log? That kind of stuff. And the second one is what do you do with the files once you have them? Um, awards, credits, um, you know, worked all states, worked uh, DXCC, whatever. So um, you may recall, uh, for those of old timers and for us new timers who read about it, that in the old days, uh, you were required by the FCC to keep a log. And it interested me was that uh, you had to keep track of uh, every time you initiated or terminated an operation, which uh, sounded kind of interesting to me. Um, the ARL has put out a little thing about uh, what is in a log. And uh, I would say that it's a pretty good uh, laundry list. It's all kind of common sense. You need to know what, who you talk to, what time, what day, what mode, um, and then signal reports and stuff like that. So. Uh, in any event, that's uh, what the ARRL suggests. Uh, there are many other things you may want to keep track of. For example, if you're doing SODA or POTA, uh, you may want to know where the where you were transmitting from or where the person that you communicated with was located. So uh, now the old way of uh, doing this was that uh, people used a pencil and a piece of paper and that's not a bad thing to keep in mind because when you're up on the mountain uh, or in a park or running mobile, you may not have a computer, so you may not be able to do a computerized uh, method of logging. Uh, there are uh, different uh, ways to do this. For example, I think Steve uh, WG0AT uh, has been known to record all of his uh, QSOs when he's on a soda peak, and then come back and at his leisure transcribe the recording and uh, then upload the, the logs into uh, the soda database. Uh, for those of you that want to do it the old way, uh, they still sell these log books. Uh, some of the old timers probably have some of their old log books, and there's a, a newer version. Uh, those are just a couple that I found on Amazon. Now there's a newer but still old way where you keep track of uh, all this uh, in an Excel spreadsheet, or you can build a table in Word, or you know you can do it in a spiral notebook. Uh, Dave uh, Kassler, K-E-0-O-G, uh, made up a rubber stamp, and so he just goes and buys a spiral notebook, and he takes his rubber stamp and stamps it, and then he fills in the squares with the uh, the date, the time, the frequency, the mode, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, this is one that I found online. I've never used it. It's a little more involved. It's more than just a, a, a basic spreadsheet. Um, but it's it's a pretty interesting idea. Uh, I, it doesn't accomplish the goals that I have for my log, which we will talk about later. Uh, but it is something to look at. Um, this is an example of one that I generated using uh, Word and tables. And it keeps track of sort of the, the basic stuff, the date, the time, the frequency. Uh, I wanted to know what my keyer speed was set at so I could figure out what I was doing. This is old, of course. 
what power you're using uh, that might be of interest uh, if you're doing QRP operations in particular. Uh, who you talk to, uh, signal reports, uh, QTHs, that kind of stuff. So the new way of doing this is uh, there are several computer programs that are designed to handle logging. Imagine that. And what they will do is uh, they create a database and then they track all kinds of data in that database and it's searchable. It's importable. It's exportable. You can do just about anything with it uh, if you so desire. So uh, it's also, once you can start to import and export, you can take these files, ADIF files, and export them into Logbook of the World or some of the contacts. I think they can upload directly into SOTA, the SOTA database or the Parks on the Air database. Uh, uh, certainly for contesting, you can upload them directly to the contest sponsor. So it's a pretty good way. I'm going to uh, let Fred take over now. Uh, I have the control of the screen, so Fred's going to have to tell me when he wants a new slide. But other than that, let's uh, listen to Fred K4ILA talk about Logger32. Fred, we don't hear you. Are you muted per chance? Everybody hear me? Now we can. Yep. Okay. I don't know if uh, you all know my ham radio history, but I started out a long time ago, and I started with the log books. Now you see the ARL log book, and I pretty much kept that log book until about two years ago when I went back to doing HF and CW operation. And so that was really complicated then to put it into those log books. And they've tripled in price uh, since I bought a batch of them about 10 years ago. But that being said, I found a software package that suited my needs, and that was Logger 32. Uh, it pretty much goes beyond the ARL logbooks and my personal requirements. And you can import it and you can export it. You can move it around into Excel if you wanted or whatever you wanted to do. Then I complicated my life even more. And about a year ago, I started operating FTA, or uh, not a, a FTA using WS, JT-X, and if you know anything about FTA, you know a QSO lasts about, what, two minutes at most, and then, uh, then you got a logging requirement, and going back to Logger 32, uh, I was spending more time logging than I was talking to people on FTA, so I had to find a solution for that, and then I looked into what was going on with WSJTX. Yes, and you can see here, uh, I was able to create eight, uh, ADIF files in WSJTX. I was able to get data to fill in the log files from a software package called Grid Tracker, and they all laterally moved across to Logger32. So then I had Logger32, and now I wanted to get even more complicated. So I was uploading my stuff into EQSL and then low TW. Now, EQSL and low TW is like sending your files into nowhere's man, a nowhere land. You never can get them back out. So I still uh, maintain. Logger 32, where I put single sideband or CW and also my FTA contacts. Now, um, future versions, I know currently Grid Tracker will automatically update uh, your logs to a low TW and also QSL, but that still leaves me with no real record of 
who I contacted and when and so forth and so on. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to fully embrace those, but I'll have to wait because I'm uh, about to upgrade my station and put in uh, a station server. And I don't know how the uh, a Unix software is behind or ahead of, uh, with Grid Tracker WSTX. But hopefully everything will be able to do ADIF and I'll solve my problems as we come along. Any questions? Is that clear, well, Bud? <laughs> no, that was clear, Fred. So, so you're manually taking um, your WSJTX and uploading it to Logbook of the World and to EQSL. No, and, I'm, going to, and, I'm going the other way, Greg. Mm -hmm. I'm getting the specific data about the guy, uh, of the person, his call sign, his address, and, and QTH, updating WSJTX. Okay, with that information. And then I'm exporting WSJTX ADF files in the log of 32 and then going to EQSL. Oh, okay. And then going to log TW. Okay, that, that's good. All right, I understand that. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll take off on uh, Ham Radio Deluxe. Um, and it's the 900 pound gorilla, I think, in this <laughs> uh, area. I honestly believe anything that you think you want to do with logging, you can do with Logbook of the World or with um, Ham Radio Deluxe. It has a separate program. It's a suite of programs, and one of the programs is HRD Logbook. Uh, on the screen now, you should see what it looks like when I open it up. Uh, in, in the center there is the actual log book, and those fields are all sizable and controllable. You can change the sequence. You can change what you want to see. I'm going to get into this uh, a little bit in the next slide, which is a little smaller, but it's the same exact information. Uh, on the right-hand column, you will see that's a DX cluster. The bottom pane in the middle there, that is a spotting cluster. The top center is the logging, and then on the left-hand side is a specific call sign lookup where you can find out things like beam heading and distance, uh, the name of the person, etc. Uh, so this is that same slide, a little smaller. So if you click, uh, can you see my mouse? Anybody see my mouse here? So if you click on the spot, what that will do is it'll put the spot in that left-hand pane and look that person up. Now, in order to get that functionality, you have to have two things. One, the program, of course, and you have to have access to the database, which is QRZ. And it will look them up, and it's a pretty good way to do it. So it also QSYs my rig to the frequency and mode of that call sign in the DX spot. So hey, it's... Greg. Yes. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about our newbies. Could could you maybe back up and drill into what's a spot and what's QRZ and what what are you trying to accomplish by having all these things, all these different windows working together? Well, that's that's a good question, Bob. Thanks. Um, so first of all, when people um, have a QSO with someone one of the things they can do is report that QSO to a spotting cluster. And then that spotting cluster aggregates all that information and, and makes it available for people who uh, want to know what other people are hearing. And there's a, actually a kind of a miniature programming language where you can uh, screen for the kinds of spots that you want to see. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. This is a spotting window there. QRZ is uh, an online database of all of the call signs in the world. And uh, it's available by subscription. Uh, I think there's some limited access if you don't have a subscription. So you can look up a call sign and get the HAM's name, address, and then uh, 
one of the functions that the Ham Radio Deluxe program does. It'll figure out the beam heading if you have a rotatable uh, antenna, and it'll figure out the distance. A lot of times, Ham want to know how far a Ham would want to know how far away they are from their contact. So it, in the spotting cluster, I have a spotting cluster, and this one is the cluster from uh, WA9PIE. And it just so happens that uh, that call sign is the call sign of the guy that now owns Ham Radio Deluxe. Uh, but if I click on that EA8RM call sign, it puts it in up above, looks the person up automatically, and then takes my rig to that frequency. And we all know that it, it, his it looks like he's at 7.63, so it's in the CW band. And so it'll switch it to, to your rig to CW mode. Uh, this is these clusters. There are many ways to, to set it up on your computer for Ham Radio Deluxe. This one is by the band that you're on. You can also get all the bands, and so you can be looking and seeing if other bands open up or if there's activity that you wouldn't normally expect. Uh, for example, people might be interested in uh, a surge of activity on 10 meters or 6 meters, and you can get that information to all appear over here on the right-hand column if you want. Uh, down below, uh, there are spots as they come in, they are chronological. Um, they can be filtered so that you get people that are, who, who hear the station and are near you so that uh, you aren't getting spots from people on the other side of the world where you know you won't be able to contact the station. So once you Find, so you can also spin your uh, VFO dial and listen to someone and then manually type in their call sign up there. Or you can click down here below in the spotting window and it will work just like the DX cluster. It will QSY your rig, put the call sign in up here and, and take you to the next step. There are some tabs that you probably can't see too well. Uh, one is QRZ.com. With one click, it will launch the QRZ program in your browser, and you'll be able to see that person's QRZ page, which can include pictures and you know textual information. It's normally pretty good. Uh, you can, with one click, uh, enter it into your logbook. And it, you enter it into your logbook by bringing up uh, an interface panel. And the interface panel, um, is in my case, in this case, is set up so that it tracks where your rig is. It knows, uh, in this case, uh, it, that it was an upper sideband signal on 14.171, which is 20 meters. It has the UTC date and the UTC time, the person's call sign, the signal report that, we're, that we exchanged, and his name. And then you can put comments in the field. Once you're satisfied with that, you can click uh, add, which is uh, F7, and will automatically put it into your log. You can also go through all these tabs down below and keep track of lots of other information. If you're talking to someone and you need that person's country for DXCC, but on another band, you can ask him if he'll QSY to that other band so you can get the contact and go. But that's what this table shows you. Uh, this call sign is ZS1OP, uh, looks like B. And so you can tell that, uh, that I hadn't worked anybody on 80, 20, or 15. Um, I, I had worked Africa, but I haven't gotten that CQ zone uh, or their locator, uh, either the, the four-digit locator or the six. Uh, in any event, you, you can use this to automatically keep track of your QSOs as you go, or you can uh, enter them all at once, in which case you can uncheck the track buttons and then just put in uh, logging information and it will do that. Uh, one of the other features of Hamry to Deluxe is it will print labels, uh, which in this case is an address label to go on the outside of an envelope. 
and on the next one is the confirmation of the QSO. Uh, so date, UTC, uh, time, uh, your frequency, the RST, and the mode. This is an FTA contact. And this is kind of a preview of what the label would look like. Uh, one other feature that, that uh, Ham Radio Deluxe does is you can get a map and you can see where you're uh, where you're heard and where, where you're contacting people. You can see there's a lot of space in the world that I have not been able to reach, or at least I couldn't when I did this a couple of years ago. So the pros are, uh, pros and cons, uh, this thing will do anything. It's searchable, customizable, uh, it generates labels. Uh, you can see at a glance information about the operator. It's seamless integration, so call sign lookup, spot and cluster integration, logbook of the world, it's one click, it launches logbook of the world, one more click, it uploads all the files that you want uploaded and you click finish. You want to download from logbook of the world, it's literally, it's three clicks. Uh, one to load the, or to launch the application, the second one to do it, and the third one to say you're finished. Uh, it, it does awards tracking also, so you can, with one click, say you want to work all states, it'll tell you which states you've worked, but you haven't had a confirmation. At one click, it'll show you the stations that you work that haven't confirmed. So you can send them a, a request for a QSL card or ask them to by email to put you in log with the world. It'll also show you which states you're missing. And it does that for any one of the recognized awards, whether it's worked all continents, whether, you know, DXCC, all that stuff. Uh, the cons, you have to buy it. Uh, I had a deal just last week where it was 35% off. Uh, so it's $100. They had a big kerfuffle a few years ago. If you buy it, you will get an operating version. They will debug it for free. If, if there's a bug, they will release the update. If you want yearly maintenance, uh, you have to renew, and, and there's typically a 15 or 20% off coupon for that. Uh, you can also uh, accelerate the performance by moving out of an access database into a SQL database, uh, but that's really for the bigger data files where you have 25 or 30,000 uh, contacts. So uh, I'm going to go to the end of this and we'll take questions at the very end. Now, the next program I want to talk about is N1MM Logger Plus. Uh, this I know people that use it for general purpose logging. It's really not designed for that. You can have a bare bones general purpose log with it, but candidly, I would not go that way. But if you are going to do any contesting at all, this is the way to go. You would uh, use a, a single panel to pick whichever contest you are trying to log for. It sets up a separate um, it's basically a code in the relational database that keeps track of logs for that one event. And then you can fill in, you know, all band, low power mode, you know, you can put in information about the exchange that you want sent and do all kinds of stuff. This is the screen that I have when I run in one MM logger plus in a contest and I am running assisted. There's a lot of information in here that would not count if you want to run unassisted and you would just have to close those windows out and uh, it's good for that. So uh, once again, you'll see that there's a DX cluster on the side. Uh, this will explain a little bit later. This shows you where the QSOs are being made right now by band and by multiplier. So you can see which bands are active. In this one, uh, this is the, uh, the actual log. This is the number of QSOs I made for this contest, broken down typically by date and by hour. Uh, this is a call sign verification. Of course, uh, this is the uh, gray line indicator. Uh, this is good for telling how quickly you're going. Uh, this little pink box shows you how long it's been since your last QSO. Uh, these guys that are real contesters, if they're on a frequency and they're calling CQ, uh, if they don't get a response, they have a, a time limit in their mind and then they will stop calling and running CQ. They will then move to search and pounce mode where they go to another, go, go answer someone else's CQ. And then this is the main interface window. Once again, I have it 
now with a little bit of an explanation beside each one. Uh, but you can see one thing that's interesting here is uh, you enter the call sign, and then in this contest, it, this is a, it looks like a DX log. Um, it, the, the sent and received uh, uh, signal report, and then it looks like a CQ zone. And so if uh, there's a green check mark beside the call sign, that means it's a recognized call sign. Uh, if it's not recognized, that'll be a red question mark. And then you can go over here and you can see it's really hard to see in this one, maybe a little bit easier here. But they take every logical mistake you could have made with the call sign and show you what the options are so you can kind of determine what you may have messed up. Um, you can, in fact, download a file that has information from all the past contests of this type, that specific contest, and it has all the data of all exchange call signs and names and information, and it will prompt you with those if you're running assisted. Uh, once again, it's a little like Ham Radio Deluxe in that you can click uh, on the cluster and it will take your rig and move you to, uh, to that frequency. Um, this is a, kind of a, an expanded version of that. It's color coded. The stations you've worked appear in green. The new stations uh, within the last couple of minutes have a new sign beside them. Multipliers are in red. And you can jump around by using the up arrow in the control or the alt on your keyboard. Um, the multipliers are really wonderful, you know, if, if you're into contesting. And so it's nice to be able to jump from spot to spot. Uh, this is the main logging window. Uh, the program is designed to run with a mouse or from your keyboard, or you can manually do everything. So, um, so when you get to a frequency, the last state, the last call sign that was near that frequency comes up above the window that you would enter. And so you listen for the call sign. And if that's the right call sign, uh, you can just hit your space bar and it'll put that information in. And then you can, by clicking your function keys on your keyboard in Morse code, it will just send the information. So if I copy EA8RM in a contest and I need to send him my call sign, if I hit F4, it will send him my call sign in Morse code. And I can adjust the speed right here and uh, it'll send it. Now, it also works in SSB. It'll send pre-recorded messages. So instead of sending that in Morse code, it would just send uh, that in uh, my voice. Uh, the third way to do this for the really fast people is something called send on enter. And it's smart enough to know that if I enter his call sign, if I hit the enter key, the F4 thing will be highlighted in yellow. It will send my call sign because it knows that's what's next. And then it's wait, uh, waiting for me to put in uh, his name and uh, received uh, uh, signal strength. And uh, once I put that in, if I, hit it, if I hit enter again, it will send my exchange to him. And then if I hit enter again, it'll log the thing. And if I'm running, it'll send CQ. Uh, so it's really an automated way to go. Uh, it may not be of interest to most people, but it's it's quite a deal. Now, the pros uh, on this is it's a free program. It's the top contesting software out there. It's uh, really functional. Um, it's Windows only, no Linux, and no Mac native. And uh, with that, I think, uh, unless there are questions, I'll just hand it off to the to Lauren to talk about Log4 OM2. Lauren? Thanks, Greg. Um, I hadn't thought about this, but when we were kind of putting this thing together, the perspectives that we're all coming at this logging a little bit differently. And so um, I'm, I'm kind of my jaw drops, I guess, with all the automation in that, uh, in that contesting stuff. Um, I am not a contester. Uh, my considerations were uh, free. I didn't want to go and invest in, in something and, uh, 
man, HR, the, uh, the ham radio deluxe app is, uh, it looks like it's pretty awesome, but I wasn't going to buy something like that until I really had tried it and uh, decided if it uh, worked for me. So I was looking for something easy to use, um, hopefully intuitive. Um, and, you know, we, I don't know if we can get by without the YouTube videos, uh, but I wanted something where, you know, I could, as complex as uh, putting some of these together are, I wanted, uh, I wanted help. So one of the keys was I wanted it to function with my transceiver, uh, the FTDX 3000, which, uh, you know, the automated uh, putting in of the, uh, the frequency, the mode, and, uh, and uh, not have to type those sorts of things in while I'm logging. I wanted it to work with the digital mode applications. Uh, so I had the same issues that, uh, that Fred was talking about, but it needed to integrate with uh, WSJTX uh, and some of the support uh, programs uh, that work with it, like JT Alert or Grid Tracker, uh, the FL Digi. Um, and um, another key point was I use an SDR Play um, software defined radio for a waterfall. And I have a, a monitor dedicated to mo looking at the bands while I'm operating. Uh, next slide, Greg. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go into all of this because it. Uh, this is the uh, the the technical aspect of this, but. Uh, just to build upon the way that Fred was doing it, Fred is moving some ADIF, the uh, ADIF files, which is the standard format for logging, so that all of these programs will actually talk with each other. But by uh, all of these being USB connections, they will talk to each other by undefined ports. And I've, I'll show a screen. I'll, uh, to just uh, indicate how these are all put together uh, later on. But the applications uh, running on the PC are all communicating with each other so that a lot of the information just gets populated automatically. So my SDR console, which is communicating with the OmniRig application, which is doing the rig control, is also talking directly to my Log4OM uh, application which, uh, which is how these uh, fields get populated automatically. Um, and then the, the uh, ADIF messages when I complete a QSO will automatically then populate the logging application. And then when, uh, we'll get into the log uh, um, LOTW later on. But as you can see, the, uh, the SDR and the transceiver are in communication and uh, the hub is uh, these applications that are communicating with each other. Um, next slide, Greg. So the Log4OM main screen uh, is all tab-based and this is what will come up uh, automatically. What I've done is I've entered Greg's call sign into here. We did not have a QSO. Uh, so what I do is I will enter a call sign, uh, W0GAS, and hit tab, and it brings up the information. So the fact that he's located in Larkspur, I can see that he's an LOTW user, which means that if we both log this and it's confirmed in LOTW, it will be an acceptable contact for a worked all states or worked all countries, worked all zones, worked all uh, continents, whatever it is that you're uh, attempting to do. But then also um, there is, uh, he's a, uh, listed on uh, QRZ. Um, the bottom screen is just the list of uh, my last log entries. Um, and then this also has the uh, spotting data. So I'm not gonna go over that, but it uh, works similarly to what, uh, what Greg uh, decided. So if I'm working on it and I just click on that link, qrz.com, this is what uh, pops up on screen. So I can get more detail of whoever it is that I'm talking to right on the spot. Uh, uh, you know, address, uh, email, uh, if we're logged in, you get that email address. 
And Greg, you mentioned that um, there's a subscription. There is for some uh, uh, advanced data modes, but for basic usage, uh, it is a free subscription and uh, just a matter of uh, logging in and uh, to get access to this information. If you're not logged in, you, you don't get the email address and you don't get his detailed address. So if you're going to send a QSL card, you've got, uh, you've got this information available. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to know if I've worked anybody before. So this guy, uh, Charlie Oscar Eight, uh, Lima Yankee in Cuba, I don't think I have ever gone on the air and, and in some band not seen this guy working. So if you need Cuba, get on a digital mode and you will, you will get this guy. He is all over. So you can see, um, I click on the tab work before and uh, there he is. I've had uh, contact uh, a year, um, 12, 22, 2018. So uh, two years ago. And uh, then again in uh, June of this year. Uh, so good information. Uh, who are they? Have you worked them before? So if you work uh, some DX stations, it's kind of amazing. You, uh, you know, you, you give a call and the, the person is already uh, responding to you with your name. And, and that's how this works. They just, uh, they know who it is because you're already in the logbook or they can get access to it on QRZ. Uh, next one. So that diagram that I showed uh, before, this is a setup screen for uh, Log4OM. And this is where you set up the messaging uh, on the ports for the different applications that are running. So I have two uh, checked off UDP inbound messages. These are coming from uh, my grid tracker application. So if I'm working on digital mode, um, I get an FT8 contact. FT8 notifies grid tracker that I worked. Uh, that was one of the uh, screen, uh, one of the, uh, slides that uh, Fred had uh, in his part of the presentation. And then uh, Grid Tracker sends the messages to the log. So I'm getting a message that when I click or when, when the uh, application says you've uh, sent the last 73 indicating that the, uh, uh, that the contact the QSO has been completed, it is automatically logging it into uh, WSJTX. Um, I don't have to do anything uh, uh, manually at all, except uh, enable transmit again to call CQ or to uh, click on somebody else's call to initiate that conversation. Single sideband, not so automatic, but uh, the digital modes, uh, this uh, is all taken care of. So then this syncs with other services. Uh, Greg mentioned, uh, click a button and it uploads the log of the world. This is the same thing. I select LOTW or EQSL or QRZ, um, uh, an online logging program and uh, select require, hit the upload selected QSO and it's gone. And then periodically I'll download confirmations uh, from log of the world and then it flags it as a, uh, as a uh, verified uh, QSO. So uh, next one. Uh, pros, full feature. This does everything I needed to do. Uh, it does, uh, at a glance, I can see who it is that I'm in communication with or completed one in a digital mode. Lots and lots of options. And um, I, I haven't I probably haven't even seen half of the, the uh, available screens or attempted to use it uh, because it just does so much more than, uh, than I need for my basic usage. Fairly straightforward integration. Um, and uh, there, are, there are a bunch of good videos. Although, as I say in the cons, there, are, there is help but a lot of it is conflicting and you do have to try stuff. And if it doesn't work, you uh, watch another one or uh, you know, do some more searching and you will probably find somebody's done it differently and you can figure out how to, how to get this done. Um, I mentioned, um, I don't use all of it, but you can grow into it. Um, and again, um, free, free to use, this is all open source. 
So um, uh, this is a Windows application. Um, it is um, not available in uh, Linux or, uh, or for Mac. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Larry, how about you? OK. Uh, basically, I started using CQR log a while back because I use Linux. And as the first bullet states there, this is available only on Linux. But the thing that's kind of interesting about it, if you want to play with it and play with Linux, you can use some sort of a virtual machine on Windows, install Linux, and put it on, and it works just fine. There's configuration on this thing. It'd take me an hour to go through it, if not longer, to give everybody the details as to the configuration. Matter of fact, I just stumbled on some new stuff today myself as I was playing around and just making sure I had everything together for this evening. As far as logs, this log, it can be uploaded as it states with to LOTW. You have to have trusted QSL installed. It can upload to eQSL. You can also, during real time, as it states in the other column, upload to HamQTH, club log, or HRD log. So you can have things happening real time. The only thing I've seen with the machine that I use to try to do that stuff is the, the latency that's involved with uh, running all of this on a, a low-end uh, laptop that uh, you, you lose some time. All the call signs, as you work them and enter them on, on the screens, which we'll see later, uh, you can go out to QRZ directly, which is a using their paid service, or to HamQTH, which happens to be written and put together by the same folks that write CQR log, and usually in HamQTH get the information related to the station that you are communicating with. Now, HamQTH is not as updated as QRZ, so there are times that I'll need to go over to QRZ and look up a call or something like that just manually and backfill things. This Q, uh, CQR log interfaces directly with FLDigi and WSJTX for the digital modes. So as fast as you can create, uh, make the contacts, it'll be logging them for you and keeping track. As soon as the call sign is entered for the station, it will tell you whether or not you worked it and when you've worked it in the past. So um, even if you're not using the digital modes and you start entering a call sign manually, it'll do the same thing for you. Um, CQR log has the ability to use Hamlib, which is what's used usually in the background for communicating with uh, numerous radios for controlling them as far as setting up the, the modes, the bands, etc. And it also has the ability for rotor control if you um, have that configured into CQR log. CQR log um, indeed uses a SQL database. And the database can reside either on the machine that you are working on or anywhere on the network that you can communicate with that database. It also has the ability to interface with the N1 MM Plus uh, logger done remotely. So if, for example, when we were doing field days, if we had somebody running an N1 MM on a Windows machine, the CQR log could interface with it directly and update those log files on the fly. <clears throat> you can also have multiple log files. Um, you can set up a log file for, say, field day, and that's all that's in that log. You can set one up for a specific contest if it's not field day or any other contest, and have those logs separate. Eventually, through the course of export and import, you can merge all those logs together. You can set up multiple profiles. The profiles can be set up for a location. So if you are running in different locations, such as some of us have the ability to, I know Bob can work from up in the up in the mountains or from at home, you can set a profile that, that separates the two for the purpose of um, managing different contest logging and things like that, like worked all states. You have to be within, I think, 50 miles of your station to have it count for a worked all states. This uh, CQR log can monitor a DX cluster. It has a contest mode and when it for various things too. So you can have multiple little windows up on your screen and see the different things such as a DX cluster 
setup, you can have, uh, it brings up a totally different little window for contesting. So it's really fast and easy to work with. You have the ability to export your log files as ADIF files, HTML files, various other things, and you can select independently what fields of the log, of which there are numerous, as to what ones you want to export to that particular mode. Uh, it'll track awards. Uh, this is something I just figured out a couple days ago. I was able to download from LLTW and EQSL all my uploaded logs and confirmations and have at my fingertips, as with uh, some of the other programs we've seen, the ability to say, okay, I've got these awards completed. I need these other states for worked all states or what have you. Um, it has the ability to bring up a small window for the purpose of grid tracking, like for similar to Grid Tracker. And uh, it'll show you the, the different grids that you've worked and which ones you need. You can, through the course of setting things up with an additional little program, uh, be able to print labels for the purpose of sending QSL cards out if you so choose. Um, this, the, both of these, uh, HamQTH and uh, CQR log, were written by uh, two gentlemen, OK2CQR OK and OK1RR. OK They're both over in Europe. And uh, they have a support mechanism a website for CQR log that you can go to and uh, register with and ask questions and things of that nature. So go ahead and go on to the next couple slides here. Uh, this is your main logging page. As soon as you fill in the call, uh, you can default the frequency, the mode, the RST received and sent. Um, as soon as you put that call in and hit enter or tab, I should say tab, it'll fill in the name, the QTH, the grid. Um, it'll default to the power that you're using and you can fill in the um, sent and received QSL information if it's not there already. It'll fill in the rest of these fields too that are available. Further down the screen, you see a little checkbox that says offline. If you check the if you do not check the offline, it will record automatically because you're on the network the start and end times for your QSO. If you check the offline, you you fill those in manually. And go ahead to the next one. This is what the the actual log looks like. You can uh, resize the columns. There's just tons and tons of information here as far as modes, bands, um, all the settings that you would typically do in, in any logbook. Uh, from this window, you can also uh, edit QSOs. You can delete them if you've got a dupe in there or something, which it will tell you about, and things of that nature. Uh, go ahead to the next one. Um, these are some of the setup things um, in the up upper left window, you can set up your networking as to what you need to do for getting information off, off the network as far as if you need a proxy server or not or what have you. And in the lower right one is where you fill in your call sign name, your QTH, your location, etc. So moving on, this is the configuration page for setting up LLTW and EQSL. You put in your username and password, and it'll go out and look at these automatically. And actually, if you back up a slide, two slides, next one. Um, it, along the top, right under where it says online log, there, yeah, right where you got the cursor, there's that little arrow. If you click on that, what it will do is it will bring up another window that gives you the ability to set up the file for being moved up to LOTW. The next little icon over will download from LOTW all the QSL information that you've already have logged up there. The next two icons, little buttons, are the upload and download from EQSL. So you, all of that is pretty automated. Okay, next slide. Whoop, okay, this is where you can set things. Yeah, right there. Uh, where you can set things up for HamQTH, club log, or HRD log net to log information on the fly. 
so that that information is right there as soon as you complete the QSO. And moving on. Okay, this one is how you, in the upper window is the configuration setup for rig control so that you can uh, control your rigs as far as either using a direct rig control or you can use the Hamlib libraries such that you can have multiple programs accessing multiple radios or a program accessing multiple radios or multiple radios being configured in different ways. And also this can be done over the network so you don't even have to have your radio control on the same machine that you have your logbook. I've done this with using um, a Raspberry Pi, running Hamlib, and controlling my radio, whereas I had my logging and everything done on a separate machine. In the lower window, it's the configuration for setting up rotor control. So as you can see, in both of these windows, that column on the left-hand side, there is just a ton of stuff that you can set different things up for. Continuing on, uh, this is the, the setup and configuration for FL Digi and WSJTX. Uh, if you set up WSJTX correctly, that it logs its contacts. It also passes the contacts over to CQR log. And if you have uh, one of the selections, which um, I don't have shown here in any of these, these slides, up, CQR log will look at the uh, WSJTX log to tell you whether or not that station that's calling CQ has been worked before and or if the grid that's associated with that station has been worked before or if you need it. Continuing on, I think that pretty much concludes this. There's just so much information for this. The, uh, the authors very bluntly state this is probably overkill for the, for the person that casually logs things, and it's more set up towards the use of contesting. But at the same point in time, I find it extremely useful and helpful and easy to use from a Linux standpoint because all my radio stuff is Linux. Well, thank you, Larry. Very informative. Um, there's some sites uh, in the references, and there's also some how-to videos. Uh, you don't need to jot them down. They'll be up on the uh, server uh, for the website. So does anybody have questions? It just I a do. comment. Those references, I just picked a couple. Uh, just you do a Google search, and you'll find a, a lot more uh, there. So. Uh, and, it, and the I don't uh, suggest that these are necessarily going to be the best. So do your own research, uh, but uh, these will get you started. All right. Well, so it seems to me that basically all of these programs have relatively seamless integration with WSJTX for you FT8 people. Um, also. Uh, it's possible with many of these to control your rig and to capture the data from your rig automatically. They all seem to interface well with Logbook of the World and to find out how to get signed up with Logbook of the World uh, in the uh, next, in the January meeting. So uh, are there questions? Let's see, I had one, Robert Barry said, in HRD settings, you set the program to talk to your radio with a cable of some type, normally a cable. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, it, setting these up, I think, is kind of an intimidating task, especially if you add the complication of a pan adapter and you're using OmniRig or Hamlib, which is the Linux one. It's actually, there's a non-Linux version, I think, of Hamlib. Uh, but it, it's, it takes a while to get these things set up because you've got a lot of things going on. There's a lot of moving parts. And once you get it done, it, it's like a breath of relief because, okay, now it's finally working. You don't want to upset the Apple cart again. So questions? And I do have a question. Thank you guys for putting all that together. I mean, 
this was a PhD program in logging, and I'm a high school dropout in logging. So for like the last year, I've I've only got into logging. I use QRZ for free uh, up until last week. And, you know, if you had that one slide where you showed on QRZ, you know, you put in somebody's call sign and then their whole profile pops up. You click log contact with, and it's there. You just have to, you know, and it even has a button, you know, log now, and you click that, or you put in a different time, you know, whatever, and then your frequency, and you got a log book, and it's there. And a lot of people use QRZ back and forth for logging. And then the other one is Logbook of the World. And I just paid my 30 bucks for a QRZ to upload my stuff to Logbook of the World. And it was two clicks and everything was there. And that's all I've done. You know, so, I mean, I'm not into contesting. I'm into collecting QSL cards. And just that simple program works good for an idiot like me. Well, that's good. Anybody else? Any... I think For th those of you who do not let Windows machines inside your house, uh, fear not. There are these uh, very similar programs for Macintosh. Uh, the one that probably mimics uh, Radio Deluxe is called Mac Logger DX, same price, and it pretty much does everything that all of these programs will do for a Macintosh. Uh, the only exception that I see is that Mac Logger D DX will not go directly to the QRZ but it will import the important pieces of information from uh, QRZ into your logging window. But for those of you who don't support the Gates Foundation, there is, there is hope back to net. <laughs> uh, a Windows, a, a dedicated Mac user. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so in all these programs, I think will allow you to get your data into ADIF files and the ADIF files, once you have it there, it's easy to logbook of the world, it, to put it in the contest if you want to do that, uh, to submit for awards. It, it, it's just a much easier project. And I think QRZ will do that. And, and a lot of people use EQSL to confirm, and we'll talk about this in the January meeting, uh, but Apparently, there's, they're worried about fraud by the hams, and so they have this double top secret, you know, password protected, you know, 15 character long hash that you have to plug in to get to Logbook of the World. You can move your life savings to your next door neighbor faster than you can get signed up for Logbook of the World. But, well, try to get anything out of Logbook of the World. Yeah. Like it's, an award. Oh my God! I, had, well, I suspect I, if you write I, a check, you're okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, but to prove it, I got work to all states with them. And man, it took me two hours to figure out how to pull it out of it. It was the true database management function that was written 30 years ago. Well, and the way that, that, that we used to do this for you old timers is before there were computers, <laughs> people would confirm by sending QSL cards. Yeah. And then there's a QSL card reader program and, and you go in and it's, it's evolved substantially, I guess, but now you, you put them all in and it's in kind of a table format and then you go to the log the QSL card checker with your um, list, if you will, of all the cards that you want him to approve. And then he matches the card to your line on your um, printout and checks them all off. And then once that's all done, he then takes that piece of paper with him and, 
and, and it's sort of the low tech way of logbook of the world. So it's still out there. You can still do it. There are people that will not use logbook of the world. Do any of those programs export into a Cabrillo file? Because a lot oh. of these uh, yeah. contests require that. Now I can go a ADI to a module in MacLogger DX, which converts it to Cabrillo. Are any of those programs capable of that? I think they all will generate a Cabrillo file. And then what, you know, like I just entered mine for the 10 meter contest and the Cabrillo file, you can mark it for edit and then it'll pop up in a text editor. And then you just copy the whole text file and put it into the submission window for the contest in one click and it's gone and you're all taken care of. But all these programs are, they're all really designed around a database. And so most anything you can do with a database, a lot of these people have figured out a way to get it done. Yeah, you know, the, I, uh, we talked a good bit about, um, you know, interfacing it among the, uh, you know, different applications. But fundamentally, when you install it, that database is configured. And if you just want to manually enter and, and do it, you can do it as simply as, as need be. And in which case, you know, just pick one that looks like it's got an easy to use uh, interface with the, uh, or user interface with the information that you want. So you can, you can walk before you run. Uh, don't be intimidated to try these thinking that you have to do all of the uh, configuration to get all of the different applications to talk to each other. But, yeah, but there may be true. an advantage to having the database local, either on your network or on your machine. So, um, and that's if I you think, remember to back it up. Well, you do, and and of course, Logbook of the World. Once you've uploaded, they have all that information, and so it's a pretty secure um, environment up there. Yeah, CQR but, Log also has the ability to uh, every time you exit the program, back up the database for you so that if you lose something, you've got a copy of it outside the normal database. And the, and the actual database that gets installed with CQR log is the MariaDB, which was based on uh, SQL, the MySQL database. Right, that's the one that you upgrade to in for free in Ham Radio Deluxe is the Maria MySQL database. Yeah, the MySQL database has got some history, which I won't get into since I, I worked for the company that bought it at one point in time. But it's, you know, the, the other one is the Access database, and, you know, it has its own quirks, too. Any, anybody else? Um, we're we're uh, going to spend some energy next time trying to explain now what you do with the data once you have it um, and how to get signed up with Logbook of the World. One last thing on CQR log too, which I failed to mention earlier, it runs fine on Raspberry Pis. So if you want to, want to control your station with a Raspberry Pi, you can in, install it and WSJTX and FL Digi and all those fun things for the digital modes and have them all work together. Or you can just use CQR log by itself. Well, I'd like to look at the contest logger because if I could figure out a way to get everything onto a Pi, that would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, it's one of the options under uh, near the top where it says, I think it says Windows, and you, you uh, drop it down and it talks about contest and it pops up a little contest window. And I found that for the first time today and looked at the list of contests that are already built into this. And I, did, I quit counting after about 50. We're good. Good. But there are some options, and there are some free options, which I think most hams appreciate. What about you, Bob? What do you use uh, K0NR? Well, oh, it's funny. I was I've been sitting there thinking about that, and uh, what what's happened for me, and I'm hearing a lot of that from your descriptions as well, is there is no one. Uh, logging software I use. I've I just looked on my my computer and I've got five loaded right now, and there is sort of a master. I I, I just switched to log for OM, and uh, I like it pretty well, and that's where everything ends up 
landing eventually. But then I've, I've got a bunch of other programs that are really good for specific tasks. One of those is N1MM, uh, really good for contesting. Uh, but I did use it today for Parks on the Air. And the reason I did that is it's a pretty straightforward program and I put it in a mode, I think it's called uh, DX or DX position. And, uh, and it just, it just, you can quickly log, log contacts and then uh, later spit it out to an ADF file and do whatever you, ever you want. Um, there's a soda logger that's really good that, that um, the logging program actually understands uh, the soda reference de designators. And so you, you plug in the soda number and the name of the mountain pops up. And so, you know, you've got the right thing, stuff like that. And, uh, oh, and then there's some um, VHF contesting loggers that I use. Uh, sometimes I use N1MM and, uh, but other times I use like VHF logger 32, I think it's called. And, and there's a couple others because they're, they're really focused on that task and, and they really nail it. Like one of them, some of them know how to do the, the roving stuff um, for VHF contests. If you're out um, doing a rover, there's some unique things about how that gets entered in the log that, that a lot of programs can't handle. So, so anyway, it's kind of a mixture. And then, and then, you know, real, we really are in the information age where you have to think about, I want to, handle the data. I want to have it land someplace where I can uh, use it later. And so that's why I tend to stick everything to log 4 om um, And then you definitely don't want to lose it, right? The worst day, worst day in a ham's life is, is to have like 10,000 radio contacts disappear from their computer and not have it backed up. So you got to be, got to be thinking about that. I think that's uh, the backup which uh, I think Larry hinted at uh, is something you need to think about. And also, I'm a believer that you want all of your logs in a single place when you're done, even if you use multiple programs to generate them. Well, I mean, a single program, if you will. And, and yeah, then you probably want, you want to store it someplace. Yeah. I think Fred's trying to say. Yeah. But, but it, it does make sense to, to try and keep a single, if you will, master log. And once we talk about the ADA files next week, it's real easy to take an ADA from a contest or from, you know, like Bob's uh, deal today, which was a POTA. He, could, he can then upload all that into his one program that maintains his master log. And uh, it just, to me, it's a lot easier than trying to have three or four different things going on. None of which is. Yeah. So Steve, Steve still on. I'd be curious what he, what, you know, how do you manage your uh, soda log, Steve? I don't see Steve. He's there. He's there. He's there. Muted. Oh. Working on it. There. Okay. I'm unmuted now. I'm sorry about that. Um, I do use, um, or an app on my iPhone to record um, my sessions, my soda sessions in, by band. And the advantage of recording it, um, the app that I use does it in, um, besides runtime, it actually logs the real time, uh, local, local real time. So all I have to do to convert that to uh, UTC is, you know, add uh, six or seven hours, depending upon whether we're, we're um, standard time or daylight saving time. But the beauty is, for me anyway, is that I can sit <coughs> the comfort of my, my desk and a cup of coffee and um, relive the the, the whole experience all over again. And sometimes I hear stuff I didn't hear when I was on top of the mountain. You know, I, I'll hear somebody that called me that never got in my log. Of course, I, I 
didn't have a QSO with them, but you know, I, I can send them an email later and say, hey, sorry, I, I missed you or, you know, because um, it, it seems, it, as you know, the, the chasers are kind of like one big family. After a while, you get to know every, everyone and uh, on a first name basis. But before that, I, I used uh, most of my logging is, is uh, portable in the sense that I'm out, out on a beach or I'm up on a mountaintop. And before that, I used Hamlog, which was a program that came along. Uh, I forget how, how long ago, but the, the advantage was that it would, it would play on a, you know, a tablet or a, a, a telephone, a cell phone. And uh, when it first came out, it, it was kind of rudimentary, but um, the developer you know, updated it and um, it got to be where, you know, it, it was really quite um, rapid. You could, you could enter a call sign and once you hit um, return or save, it was loaded, ready to take the, the, the next call sign. And, you know, it populated all the information, all the fields. It was just waiting for you to type in another call sign. And it would output um, several different formats. So that's kind of my story. <laughs> when, when you take your audio recording, uh, you, you know, like for Sodi, you have to submit it uh, electronically to, to get credit. So how, what do you type it into? Uh, I just, I've, I've got a text file that's set up. Um, with all the you know fields and everything, and it it saves it out as a CSV file, and that's what I upload to uh, the Soda database. The uh, Mac Logger program has the capability of an iPad app, which you can take that wherever you go. And it is a slightly scaled down version of what you have on your uh, desktop. You enter the thing in, and if you should have cell phone coverage, it will, uh, you know, give you a little bit more information. But you can then bring that thing back home and sync it up with your uh, program at home. And it, it's... The, the cool thing about the Mac deal is that that um, iPad app is included with the Mac logger. So I don't know how many of these Windows programs you have to get your um, uh, Droid program and pay for it. But it's a pretty slick deal, and it has very, very good customer service. This guy, if you write him an email, you know, in about three minutes, he's back uh, telling you what to do and how to debug it and everything like that. So it's, it's pretty refreshing to have that kind of customer service back to net. Good. Well, there's a lot of options out there, <clears throat> but I think the basic functionality with most of them is pretty good these days. And with that, I, I guess uh, we don't have any more questions. We uh, we do have a, a Mac lovers group forming. Uh, apparently, Jim White's been nominated to run that. <laughs> what did I get? I was reading something. What did I get nominated for? To run the Mac okay. lovers group. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. When COVID's over, we'll have a meeting at uh, Fox Run. And hey, Jim, I didn't even know you used Mac. So do I. Yeah. It's. I, I, the, it's a long story, but for years I had to do windows with Motorola radios and with the television station and this and that. And I just, oh, it was a, it was a nightmare. I'd get out at a racetrack somewhere and Motorola would change the firmware or Apple or uh, Mac would, uh, uh, windows would do something. And I'm sitting there with 85 radios. I got a program and they don't work. Then when I went to the television station, the whole darn thing runs on a Windows computer. And I, I was just fed up with it, came home one night and said, I'm getting a MacBook, and I haven't ever looked back. 
yeah. it just not look back. So if, if people are, uh, you know, interested in trying some of these and you get stuck, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, there's, we'll, um, we'll, we'll help you. There's, a, there, there's a, a, a lot of similarities among these programs. I've used CQR log in the past uh, and run it on a Raspberry Pi, and it just happens mm -hmm. that I've um, integrating some stuff on a Windows machine now. So um, I can't help you with the Mac. Um, that, that stuff is non-intuitive to me, but uh, um, I'll, uh, you know, if, if you want to give it a try and you run into some issues, just uh, yell. Right. I think any one of us <clears throat> would be glad to answer questions, uh, including Jim and Bob. Uh, about stuff we talked about and, and, you know, maybe address any specific concerns that you might have about one versus the other. But uh, the, the thing is, I think that most of us do keep logs and it's, it can be as involved as you want, but the, the bare bones stuff is in that ARRL slide, the date, time, frequency, call sign, signal report, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then it can go uh, beyond that. We were talking earlier tonight about the guy in South Africa, and he's got some kind of a logging program. And, and as soon as he recognizes a call sign, he's able to ask a personal question to the person he's talking to. And he knows the last time he worked him, and he knows the guy's dog's name. I mean, it's, it's amazing. There are some. Yeah, I've always there. wanted to ask him what program, uh, you know, maybe I will do that the next time we chat. I promised we would chat before Christmas, and he said, I'll hold you to it. Well, so I sent him an I'll email, ask. and he didn't answer. So maybe he'll answer you uh, if you reach out. We shall see. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Well, let's uh, adjourn. Uh, the next meeting is in January, the third uh, Monday. I think it's the 18th. Don't hold me to that. Um, and then uh, during that, there will be some further discussions on how to get into Logbook of the World and maybe how to move some of these ADF files around, uh, but mostly Logbook of the World, I suspect, and maybe a little bit on um, the card readers which just sounds like they're having a seance, but uh, uh, <laughs> in any event, I digress. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy, Happy holidays Hanukkah. to all. Happy holidays. Merry um, Christmas, everyone. All right. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. All right. Take care. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thanks. Bye-bye.